From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney will go over her recommended principles of record keeping for the commercial cow-calf operation. She'll cite reproductive proficiency and feeding efficiency as two areas in particular that you commercial cow-calf producers should pay attention to. Then K-State's Jeff Whitworth will comment on last week's record cold weather in Kansas and if it adversely affected overwintering crop insects. Jeff says the temperatures yet to come this spring will likely be more telling than last week's plunge. And on this week's wildlife management segment then, K-State's Charlie Lee looks at the possibility of fish winter kill in farm ponds. All that and more right here on this Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, our Tuesday edition. Thanks for joining us once more. Into the area of cattle herd record keeping now, as we're joined by Jamie Lynn Farney. Jamie Lynn is the Research and Extension Beef Systems Specialist for K-State, based in southeast Kansas, and she pulled together some thoughts on records that would be appropriate to the commercial cow herd, as she put together a recent podcast. So, Jamie Lynn, we're into a new production season. It's calving for a lot of producers out there. You think that the commercial operation could maybe shore up their record keeping some? I really do. And, you know, you hit on one of the main points. Record keeping for a commercial producer is going to be different than record keeping on the purebred operation. Uh, we don't necessarily have to have every individual calf's weight. Well, actual weaning weight is pretty good. But all of the extra information that you have to have with purebred, you don't with your commercial. There's some just generalities that a commercial producer needs to keep in regards to records. I always spend my record keeping management from the perspective of you want to keep records on something that will have economic viability for your operation. Well, with that as the definition, you might list the generalities that you think would be appropriate for the commercial operator in their record keeping. You know, of course, reproductive efficiency is one of the first ones. Feeding efficiency, and um, I might harp on that a little longer just because maybe I'm a nutritionist, <laughs> but we often forget about keeping track of the feed going in and the feed coming out, you know, until you go to work on your tax documents and and then you're like, oh man, I spent that much on feed. But using feed efficiency to be able to help in your operation, those are two of the big ones that you think of. But another one is culling. You never want to think about culling as something you're going to have to do beyond, oh, this cow's old or this cow's open. The way our weather has been, you never know. We may have a drought that's going to lead you to culling 20% or 25% of your herd to be able to sustain your younger, maybe your higher genetics, et cetera. You know, and then another one that's really fresh on our minds right now, and I'm telling you this so you can go out and get your pictures now, but for all of the disaster indemnity programs, record keeping off of that, we need to make sure, you know, if you had a much higher death loss on your baby calves born in that storm, get out there, get your records, get your pictures, get your videos so you can take advantage of those programs. Let's hone in on reproductive proficiency. What to record there precisely? What are the data points that uh, the commercial operator could value here? You know, uh, several of these points I uh, had borrowed off of an article that Sandy Johnson had wrote for Beef Tips that came out in January. In regards to your reproduction, it really kind of is based on whether you are 
maintaining your own replacements within your operation or you're purchasing replacements from some other location. So I always think about keeping your own replacement heifers because there's some fun little things to do on that. We know that heifers that are born in the first 21 days of any calving season, they will have an extra calf in their life, are more likely to breed earlier in the season, wean more calf weight, all a bunch of big positives. Now, I told you, we don't necessarily have to be as in-depth in our commercial operation as we are in our purebred in knowing, say, exact birth dates of those calfers. So you can do some pretty simple managerial record keeping by using ear tags as your record keeping protocol. When those heifers are born, say you have one color for everything born in the first 21 days of the calving season, and then you switch to a different color for the after 21 days. So when you go to make your replacement heifer decisions, you only keep those heifers with that specific color of tag. If you don't wanna buy two different sets of tags, two different colors of tags, All of them born in the first part of the season, tag them in the left ear. Mm -hmm. After 21 days, tag them in the right ear. Uh, Or you could use notching, uh, you know, get your knife or uh, one of those pig ear taggers and cut a little notch in to indicate month of birth, even if you wanted to do that. So you, you can do something like that to help you with making that first heifer selection decision. The other thing, For your cows, and this can qualify for both, whether you're keeping your own replacements or you're purchasing your replacements, is any time you have a cow in the chute, if she gave you cause to be in there outside of traditional preg check or vaccinations, if she was bad-tempered, wouldn't pair up, bad-uttered, you had to milk her out, Mark her tag in some fashion that you know says, this lady needs to go by, <laughs> <laughs> especially when you're talking about some of your culling decisions. And be very, I guess, stringent with yourself or strict with yourself. If they've got that notch, they need to get on the coal truck. Mm-hmm. So those are just a, a couple of things to think about. You know, the most expensive cow to feed is that open animal that is not raising you a calf. So when you're pregging, ear notch them so that you know or, uh, you know, mark a spot on their tag to indicate that they're open. It can be a simple system, but yet one that the producer needs to dedicate themselves to to make it work. One of the more overlooked areas, you mentioned it, Jamie Lynn, the feeding efficiency of the commercial cow herd. What objectives do you have in mind here in as far as that part of record keeping? You know, that's one of the things that when you end up having a problem, that's one of the first things, like a reproductive problem or especially a reproductive problem. We go back and want to talk to you about, you know, what was the condition of your cows? What were you feeding your cows? What was their intake? Most of the producers could not give you a good round estimate of what their animals were consuming. During the winter, especially, We're going out and putting out hay bales on a pretty regular basis. And, you know, you're looking at your cows and say you look at them and it's like, oh, man, they're starting to get thin. Well, when you go and visit with your nutritionist, we'll be like, okay, yeah, you're putting out this hay. How much are they consuming? Easy record keeping process. When you put out a bale of hay, have your little tally sheet, you know, or or your little calendar that's stuck on the dash of your truck or something and just put out. I put out two bales of hay to this pasture on this day. Something simple as that. But periodically, do take that hay estimate and divide by the number of days and number of cows out there and see what they are actually eating. If you just record it and don't interpret it in some fashion, that can cause you some issues. Another one that I really think about a lot that can save you a lot of money, is monitoring your mineral intake. Same concept as when you're putting out your hay. When you put out mineral, mark it. Say, hey, I put out two bags of mineral to this pasture on this date. And then when you're looking back through your calendar, it's like, wait a minute. I happen to put out two bags of mineral every other day for this set of cows. 
and my mineral should have lasted a week. That would then allow you to make some strategic management decisions to add salt so that you reduce the amount of intake, move your feeder away, because anytime they're consuming two, three, four times what you had calculated, usually two, three, four times what they need, (laughs) you are losing money. So those are just some very simple numbers to keep in mind. You know, like I said, as a nutritionist, I love having that information because you could be like, okay, well, I'm feeding this brome hay with three pounds of corn and a pound of distillers and my cows are still losing weight. Well, when you say how much hay they're eating, if they're just not eating enough hay, you can use that to help us be able to determine better diets for your animals. And you can, again, formalize this without going overboard with too much detail, but but enough to help you make some judgment calls on the program and then on calling decisions. It all weaves together, Jamie Litt. It really does. And oftentimes, the form of your record keeping can help you with that as well. You know, there's great tools out there, you know, the traditional red book that has your calving records, but also a feed page at the back too that you can use your tally for your hay or your mineral. But just a simple 12 month calendar is a wonderful tool just to write stuff in, keeping it in your truck. And so a little bit of information and then spending a little bit of time. It doesn't have to take it all day to do what I call diagnostics. Just look at your stuff. Point is, commercial operators, re-examine your record keeping. See what you might add to, shore up, improve. This is a great time to do all of that. Jamie Lynn, it's always good to talk about this topic with you. We appreciate you being along with us. Thank you, Eric. (laughs) Jamie Lynn Farney is a beef systems specialist with K-State Research and Extension. By the way, she got into this topic in quite some depth in one of her recent podcasts. You can find that by simply searching for Dr. J's Beef. We'll be back with more on Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Well, with our dastardly cold weather in recent days, Numerous questions have arisen about the impacts on agriculture, and one of those we'll get into right now with our guest, crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth, K-State Research and Extension. And you're hearing this from the countryside as well, Jeff. Those deeply cold temperatures, well below zero, have they had any sort of impact on overwintering crop insect pests here in the state? And it's a wide open question, you say. (laughs) Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, and every year, you know, we have cold weather in the winter, right? Or sometimes we have warm weather in the winter, and I get questions, how does this seriously cold weather affect the insects, or how does this little warmer than normal spell in the winter affect insects? And first thing you got to remember is most of our insects, or all of them that I can think of at least, have been here a lot longer than we have. Uh, so they've been through a lot of different types of climatic changes whether it's in the winter or the summer or whatever it is. So some of the insects that I always get questions about, and it, the the winter weather can affect insects. There's no doubt about that. Insects, are their development is completely controlled by weather up to a point, and they, they've managed to adapt to too hot conditions, too cold conditions, whatever. But still, if they get caught in between, sometimes it can affect their population. So the ones we that I've been getting questions about and the ones I normally get questions about relative to winter weather are, first of all, winter grain mites. Winter grain mites are, as the name implies, generally out there in the winter on wheat. Now, they can be on any grass, uh, but the one we normally worry about is wheat. And normally, as the name implies, they're winter grain mites, so they're out there during the cool weather, you know, when it's uh, 
50 degrees to about 32 degrees, and they'll be in the soil, and the eggs will be in the soil. So does the winter coldness actually affect them? Not so much before they've broken dormancy. Once they've broken dormancy, kind of like wheat, if the crown of the plant hasn't gotten above ground or gotten a, a, so far up in the soil, the cold weather's not going to affect them. Well, insects are kind of adaptable like that also. So if they're far enough down in the soil, whether it's the uh, insect itself or the eggs, it's probably not going to affect them. Even with the extreme, extreme cold weather. Even with the extreme temperatures. I mean, these aren't extreme. We've had these temperatures before, you know, back in the 80s and the 70s and the 60s, and we still have these pests, and they've survived all those times. It may impact them a little bit early on, but winter grain mites, probably not so much. So the thing about winter grain mites, and I've had a couple of calls about them, is how the dryness affects the wheat crop. Once the wheat crop breaks dormancy, we will assume the winter grain mites will not be that affected. There's millions of them out there. So even if it kills 30 or 40 percent, there's still plenty to get out and cause a problem or cause concern at least. So once that wheat breaks dormancy, if it's dry and the winter grain mites start feeding on it, you may see the typical silvering or browning of the leaf tips, and then that may move down. But once we get adequate moisture, once we get more moisture, the wheat plants will pretty much outgrow the winter grain mite feeding. The other one I get a lot of questions about is, well, there's two more actually, the alfalfa weevil and chinch bugs, uh, because chinch bugs, will, they overwinter as adults for the most part, and they come out and they will get into the wheat. Again, if it's a dry spring, they can thin wheat out a little bit early on, and then they will their populations will build up, and they will move into sorghum or corn or golf courses or any other kind of a grass. But the, alf- the uh, chinch bug overwinters as an adult. And back in the 70s and the early 80s, the Kansas Department of Agriculture actually did overwintering surveys to see how the various winter weather uh, over about a 10 or 12 year period of time affected the overwintering survivorship of chinch bugs. And so they would go out all around the state, collect chinch bugs from bunch grass roots, bring them in, count them, and then they would see how that uh, winter weather affected the following spring populations. And they ceased doing the survey just because it was too variable. You, you might find one spot where the winter weather really drastically reduced the chinch bug population, but still the spring came along and they were able to compensate by laying eggs and surviving. So the winter weather effect was negated in the spring later on. The alfalfa weevil, a little different story. The alfalfa weevil comes into the alfalfa field in the in the fall, and they generally lay eggs in stems of alfalfa plants, and they will overwinter as an egg or an adult, mostly an egg stage. So if the eggs are right up there in the stems, lots of times the winter weather may affect the egg, may reduce the viability of the egg a little bit. A lot of times the winter weather uh, knocks the stem down, then we get some snow on top of it. And that snow will insulate, you know, the stem with the eggs in it. And the adults, they can be underneath the leaf litter or the residue in the alfalfa field. So, you know, every few miles, there's a different little ecological niche. And wherever those eggs are and wherever those alfalfa weevil adults are, that can make a big difference as far as how cold the temperature actually gets. We've done studies over the years, so for the last 40 years, trying to figure out the impact of temperature on insects. And we've done a pretty good job, but you don't know what the actual temperature is in the niche where those eggs, in this case for alfalfa weevils, what the actual temperature is in that location. Now, you can go to the, you know, K-State has the measle net. You can go to the measle net. We are accumulating growing degree days or thermal units or whatever you want to call them at different locations and different temperature soil depths, and that might help you uh, predict when, in this case, alfalfa weevil eggs are going to hatch. But you need to click on the location nearest you because, like I said, just a few miles can make a big difference. You might have six inches of snow You know, in this county and nothing in this county, and that snow will insulate those insects. So you need a field-to-field evaluation is what you really need, as best you can? Actually, you know, we still go back to just get out and do the typical IPM 
you know, integrated pest management procedures or scouting procedures get out as the alfalfa starts to break dormancy or the wheat starts to break dormancy, get out and scout for the insects themselves. Generally speaking, cold temperatures will really affect alfalfa weevils once the alfalfa has broken dormancy and once those eggs start to hatch. Last year in 2020 and in 2018 in the spring, if you'll remember, 2018 was the third coldest April we've had on record. 2020 was pretty cold also. So as those eggs start to hatch, remember the overwintering stage of alfalfa weevil is the egg stage. As those eggs start to hatch, those larvae come out. Then if we get a cold spell down into the mid-20s for a couple of hours, it will decimate those larvae. It will kill the larvae as they hatch out of those eggs. Uh, We saw that last year, and we saw that in 2018. But all the eggs won't hatch at once. So then it warms back up, and last year we had three different spells, I think, of uh, mid-20 degree temperatures. Uh, So a few larvae would hatch out, got cold again, killed those. So last year in 2020, there were many fields that didn't have to be treated that never did reach the treatment threshold for alfalfa weevils just because of the cold temperatures. But the cold temperatures up until the point in time when the alfalfa broke dormancy or the eggs came out of diapause or broke dormancy has very little effect or really an effect that's hard to measure, hard to quantify on those populations. So, again, just get out there, and and if the cold weather has an effect on alfalfa weevils, maybe they won't reach the 30 to 50 percent treatment threshold. Maybe it'll only be 10 percent. That happened last year. Or, you know, you may get another cold spell that comes along and helps produce those. The ones I'm wondering about are the insects that migrate into Kansas, the aphids, the leafhoppers, you know, some of the army worms. Uh, some of those things, because this cold spell apparently went all the way down to almost the Rio Grande River, mm-hmm. or almost the border between Texas and Mexico and further south. A lot of our insects apparently overwinter down there. So the way I look at this, those insects may not be as well adapted to these cold temperatures. Again, it just depends on how cold, for how long, and where they are when the cold weather comes along. But That's what I look at more, probably going to have a little more impact on our insect pests this year in Kansas, rather than the ones that are actually adapted and and overwintering in the state. Again, the message here is don't amend your normal insect control plans, your IPM, if you will, uh, just because of our cold spell, to say the least. Plan on carrying on your management program as you normally would. Yes, I would not count on the frigid conditions to help protect my crops against attack of insects or mites. It might, but you still have to get out there and scout and determine that for yourself. And the same with those pests that migrate in uh, later on in the year, the aphids uh, and those kinds of things. Now, also some beneficials, you know, lady beetles and uh, lacewings and some of those, they overwinter in Kansas also. So, Hopefully they've found good places also to get through these frigid temperatures that we've had the last couple of weeks so that they survive, so that they can help control some of these pest insects also. Jeff, thanks as always. And because we will likely have pests back, we will have you back as well as we get into warmer weather. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. He's Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. Agriculture Today returns. After this break, you're listening to the K-State Radio Network. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today, and welcome back. Eric Atkinson with you. On over now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
And the USDA's National Agricultural Statistics Service putting out its latest crop progress and condition report for Kansas. Of course, that is primarily about the wheat crop. For the week ending this past Sunday, our topsoil moisture supplies in the state at 7% surplus, 51% adequate, and 42% short to very short. Subsoil moisture at 4% surplus, 52% adequate, and 44 short to very short this week. The condition of the winter wheat crop in Kansas at 40% good to excellent, 34% fair, 26% poor to very poor. Incidentally, the USDA will resume its weekly crop progress and condition reports this coming week. The EPA is changing course on small refinery exemptions to the renewable fuel standard, announcing yesterday that it agrees with a Court of Appeals decision last year that the agency had mismanaged the program under the Trump administration, with a ruling out of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals now before the U.S. Supreme Court this spring. Yesterday was the deadline for the EPA to file a brief with the Supreme Court over whether the Biden administration would back the previous administration's view on refinery exemptions. The Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals is based in Denver. It had ruled back in January of last year that the EPA mishandled the exemptions program when it came to three small refinery exemptions in particular. The Trump administration delayed action on the renewable fuel standard to reflect the court's decision. Now, from 2016 to last year, the EPA granted 88 small refinery exemptions. The ethanol industry made a successful challenge to the EPA's granting of three exemptions in 2016 and 2017. The Tenth Circuit case was originally brought against the EPA by the Renewable Fuels Association, the National Corn Growers Association, American Coalition for Ethanol, and the National Farmers Union. The EPA said the market increase in the number of exemptions approved over the past four years hurt the biofuels industry and rural America. Experts say that farm sector debt is likely to rise again this year. Here's more on that from the USDA's Gary Crawford. The number of farm bankruptcies last year dropped by 7% from 2019, thanks partially to a huge influx of government payments to farmers, which sent farm income overall up from 2019. Although some states did have more bankruptcies, Iowa, for example, recording the largest number of bankruptcies in 10 years. So what can we expect this year nationwide? Well, for one thing... Overall, we're forecasting farm sector income to decrease in 2021. While expenses increase, an agriculture department analyst Carrie Litkowski told USDA's Outlook Forum that more farmers will be in more debt. We think more of their production is going to have to go to uh, making debt payments. However, according to Nate Kaufman with the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City... I don't know that it's necessarily clear that we will see an outright increase in bankruptcies as a result of that. He says the increase in farm income last year may help many struggling producers stay in business this year. Gary Crawford reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, the weekly feature for you dairy producers out of the Animal Sciences and Industry Department here at K-State. Milk Lines, standing by, is K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today, I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning some issues that we're seeing in the marketing of feedstuffs. I don't know how much attention you've been paying to the feedstuff market, but if you haven't been paying close attention to this, you probably need to start. Things I'm really thinking about here are the price of corn and the price of wheat. If you look at your current corn price, many places around the state, you're probably looking at much over $5 a bushel, and in many cases, probably 5 and a half or a little more. As you look at the price of wheat, it's probably somewhere around the $6 range per bushel, maybe $6.10. So as you think about this, we've kind of got a rule of thumb in the feed industry that If we put a 7 to 10% premium on the price of corn and we can buy wheat for that price or less, we should probably be buying it or at least thinking about using it in our diets. And if we apply that principle, we're already in that range probably in many of our market areas. Now, 
Things are a little bit different right now because of the price of soybean meal. I know in many of our dairy rations we use some other protein sources, but those protein sources tend to follow the soybean meal market as well. So if you think about soybean meal prices right now, you're probably looking at about $450 a ton delivered to your farm, maybe slightly higher again depending on transportation. As you think about this decision between corn and wheat, Corn only has about 9% crude protein generally and wheat 14. So looking at that, that 5% crude protein difference between those two, that means in a bushel of wheat, we would get about 8.4 pounds of protein, but out of a bushel of corn, only about 5. So there's a couple things to think about here. Number one, a bushel of wheat is 60 pounds and a bushel of corn is 56. So when you think about that, on a hundred weight basis, if wheat is worth six dollars a bushel, that's equal to ten dollars per hundred weight, and corn at five dollars and sixty cents is worth ten dollars a hundred weight. But now here's the really important thing to consider: a hundred weight of wheat has a lot more protein than a hundred pounds of corn. So as you think about that difference, that's about five pounds more crude protein per 100 pounds of wheat versus 100 pounds of corn. If protein, based on soybean meal price, is worth about 46 cents per pound, that additional five pounds is going to be worth over $2 more in 100 pounds of wheat than what you have in 100 pounds of corn. And that's the big difference. So in today's market, when we look at the price of soybean meal, we also need to consider that this old thumb rule of 7 to 10% premium for wheat over corn is really not the same thing that we need to be thinking about in today's market. That premium for wheat is probably maybe 22 to 25% the value of corn. So now, I think it's important that you spend some time with your nutritionist and taking a look to see if maybe in a cost savings for our dairy, we need to consider feeding some wheat in the ration as opposed to just simply feeding all corn. Again, you need to think about the prices of wheat and corn in your market area, but also the value of protein and how bringing wheat into the diet will save you on protein cost. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. Charlie Lee awaits to talk with us about another aspect of wildlife management after this final break. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Next up on Agriculture Today, our weekly segment on wildlife management, aboard once again, former K-State wildlife specialist Charlie Lee. The topic you pick up this week, Charlie, quite appropriate for our recent weather in Kansas, that deep freeze cold that we endured, and that is winter kill to fish in farm ponds. This happens maybe more often than people think. Yes, it's a fairly common occurrence. There are several things uh, that can impact it, but really we need to start off by telling folks what it is. It's the die-off of fish that's in a pond during the winter under the ice. Once we know a little bit more about why winter kill happens and understand kind of the science behind that, we understand why it happens sometimes and, and why a pond may be adjacent to it doesn't have the same type of situation occur. First, winter kill is when a bunch of fish all die off during the winter. It's fairly common in shallow ponds that have a lot of vegetation. Sometimes all the fish in a pond will die, but other ponds, other situations, other winters, it's possible for some fish to die and others to live. That somewhat depends upon the species of fish that are in the pond. For instance, bullhead catfish are much more likely to survive through a moderate winter kill than something like a large, largemouth bass fish. Primarily, some of the larger species of fish require more oxygen. Bass take more oxygen than, than bullheads, so bullhead can live in a much harsher environment, in an environment that has less oxygen and poor water quality. 
The severity of the winter kill determines if a few fish, if many fish, or if most of the fish die. But when you look at the situation, it's also not just the ice that's covered, it's the duration of that ice being covered on the pond. It's also have to factor in the pond depth and the pond productivity. When you look at all of three of those items, you can start to understand why some ponds experience more winter kill than others. Well, then talk about the pond depth and why that's a difference maker. Well, when we talk about pond depth, we have to think about the reason that fish can survive in the winter and the properties of water. Water is the densest when it's about 39 degrees and becomes less dense at increasing and decreasing temperatures. During the warmer months, the pond is warmest at the surface, and then the temperature decreases with depth. In the fall, the surface cools and the water becomes denser than the layers that are underneath it. Uh, when the pond reaches 39 degrees all the way through, the surface of the pond continues to cool off. And then at 32 degrees, ice starts to form. So that's uh, important to realize that the deeper pond often will have a thermocline layer, and there will be some water that may be about 39 degrees at the deeper parts of that pond. Uh, when you look at pond design and pond productivity, it's related to a couple of things. It's also related somewhat to pond depth and water productivity and water clarity. We realize that uh, what's important uh, here in the pond is oxygen for the fish. That oxygen comes from wind blowing across the pond in a small amount, but of course that doesn't occur when the pond is frozen over. Uh, the fish are using oxygen uh, but this oxygen is being produced by the phytoplankton and aquatic plants that are in that pond. In very shallow ponds, there's usually a lot of aquatic vegetation, which is producing a lot of oxygen in warm weather conditions. In the fall, when it's cold, the pond is now frozen over. By midwinter, those plants are decaying, and those bacteria are using up some of the oxygen in the pond as those fish are struggling to find oxygen, they're competing with the bacteria on that decaying vegetation. So the more vegetation you have in a pond, typically in ponds that are shallow, then you're going to have less oxygen produced that will be available for the fish. Then that clarity factor, you say the, the cover on the ice itself would figure into this. Yes, water clarity, the Depth at which you can see an object in the water is certainly important for a couple of reasons. First, when you have clear ice, you're going to get some sunlight to penetrate through that ice and still allow the plants to produce oxygen in beneath the ice. If uh, the water is clear during the summer, you have plants that are able to get that oxygen all the way to the bottom. So you often have more aquatic vegetation in ponds that have clear water. So those ponds that are, have more turbidity don't have the phytoplankton and the aquatic plants all the way through the water. So that also, just like snow cover, can reduce the penetration of sunlight and change the likelihood of a winter kill. Well then, what, if anything, can pond managers do to lessen the chances of fish loss to winter kill? Well, there are some things that can be done. Frankly, most people uh, aren't aware of a problem occurring until it is too late. But oftentimes, uh, surface aeration is going to be the only thing that's going to be effective. Going out and simply cutting a hole in the ice is probably not going to provide any benefits. You also can cause some problems by over-aerating a pond and getting rid of that thermocline that may be there that is providing some water that is a, a slightly warmer. With over-aeration, you can change that water temperature all the way through that water column and also cause problems. So winter is that time of year when many fish species start to bulk up and start putting their energy into developing eggs. 
and that's kind of the reason that this is the time of year. There are many fishermen that are out fishing because you're going to catch bigger fish, but most of those are females that also have eggs. So it really comes back to things that you've talked about time and again, good pond construction and maintenance. Yeah, that is all part of the solution to try to minimize the problems with ponds. By proper planning, you can have a more productive and enjoyable farm pond. Well, that's the inside story on what leads to winter kill, fish winter kill in farm ponds. Charlie, thanks for letting us know more about this right here. Former wildlife specialist Charlie Lee of K-State Research and Extension with us. Well, previewing tomorrow's broadcast, we plan to talk with K-State's Sarah Lancaster about early spring control of kochia ahead of row crop planting and more on the new crop insurance options and a handy tool from K-State that helps you evaluate those. We'll welcome K-State's Jenny Ift in for that, along with more here tomorrow. Please rejoin us then, won't you? Meantime, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today, over this, the K-State Radio Network.